And this is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who were there and those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. May be seated. Okay, when I travel to some place new, I love to do a lot of research beforehand. You know, and I still buy those old fashioned tour books, but not one, two or three tour books. And then I call the internet for the 10 best things to do in such and such a place. I calculate the time for each stop, which restaurants to eat on a course. All the hotel stays along the trip. I like to even pick my own route in a foreign country, but that often means deciphering train schedules and even occasionally being daring, driving a rental car on the wrong side. But I will admit that I spend a lot of my time checking those schedules, poring over the maps, making sure we don't miss an important tourist spot, and that can take away from the experience. Well, and then there's the other way that I don't like as much. You go with a tour guide in a bus and then have someone else plan it out and give you all the background info. With the tour group, the most you have to worry about is keeping an eye out for that flag or sign that the leader keeps waving to try to keep you together. I do admit that in a guided tour, sometimes it may be easier to keep the big picture in mind if someone else is watching those details. And we're not dragged down by those details. Sometimes you do take in what's going around you more fully. In our gospel story today, the disciples are definitely feeling the pressure of details and thinking their tour director, i.e. Jesus, isn't quite handling everything. You see, this whole episode of the feeding of the, five, of the multitude wasn't planned at all. Jesus hadn't prepared on this stop on his preaching and healing campaign. In fact, Jesus was looking for some downtime away from it all because he heard about the execution of his cousin John the Baptist. Jesus went off in the wilderness, but those crowds, they just went looking for him. And they find him in this deserted place, and Jesus doesn't turn them away. He responds to their needs. He spends the day taking care of them. It's all spontaneous and improvised and, well, wonderful. But the disciples are getting edgy. They realize there's no dinner stop on the agenda. They say to Jesus, hey, are you thinking about simple things like food for all these people? What are they going to eat? Maybe you should send them away in time for them to get back into town and grab a bite. But Jesus is not going to play their game. He basically says, hey, if you're worried about it, why don't you handle it? They don't need to go away if you get them something to eat. Now Jesus has hit the heart of the matter. The disciples are worried about dealing with a hungry crowd. Jesus is focused on healing and giving hope to the people. We have no indication that the crowd was concerned. Nobody was packing up and leaving and saying, well, it's getting late, we'll have to catch more of this Jesus some other time. No, Jesus and the crowds are into the moment. They're experiencing God's presence. 
They're getting spiritually and physically healed. Lives are being changed. No one is worried about their tummy rumbling except, of course, the disciples. So Jesus uses this as a teaching moment. Jesus says, in effect, great, you're concerned about these people might go hungry? Well, so if it'd be a shame for this healing to stop, why don't you round up some grub for these folks? But the disciples have the answer prepared already. They say, we only have found two fish and five loaves of bread, not anywhere near enough for over 5,000 people. Now comes the object lesson. Jesus tells them to have everyone prepare for dinner. He has them bring the paltry fish and bread. He tells them all to recline on the grass as they would at a dinner table. He blesses the food and there's enough for everybody with a lot of leftovers. There are echoes here that point to Jesus being the Messiah, being God in the scene. It had happened before in a wilderness. God provided bread in the form of manna for the Israelites. Jesus, in his sacrifice for us, will provide his body as our spiritual bread. Even though they are in a deserted place, they sat down on grass. You see, the good shepherd has indeed found good pasture for the sheep. This meal proves that Jesus is not any magician, but that Jesus is our God and provides food when none is available who provides pleasant places to feed in the midst of the deserts of our lives. Jesus provided not just for their spiritual needs and their physical healing that day, Jesus even provided the daily bread, the basics to get by. Now the disciples got hung up on worries about such trifling matters, such small little details. What if Jesus hadn't performed the miracle with the loaves and the fishes? Have you thought about that? Wouldn't most people trade going hungry and skipping supper to have themselves cured and fed spiritually? When you're in a life-changing moment, isn't it worth skipping a meal? Now, when I travel, I like deciding where to go and controlling what I do every minute I am in a new place. I admit that. But I do realize it comes with a trade-off. I spend time trying to figure out what to do since I went to the wrong platform and I just missed the train I planned to catch. I have to spend extra time juggling my maps, checking my notes. I could be taking in the view. I'm right there with the disciples. In the middle of a sacred miracle, in the very presence of God, I could see myself worried about crazy, stupid little things. In the middle of Berlin, my camera was often idle. I'm not looking up and enjoying the buildings because my head's buried in schedules and maps. In the middle of life and important events, instead of focusing on what's important, sometimes I get caught up with small details that really don't matter much. How often have I missed God working wonders around me because spiritually at least, I had my head down. The disciples focused on the fact there was no field available out in the boonies when they had the bread of life right in front of them. They had Jesus, who could feed not only soul and spirit, but could also rustle up dinner at the snap of a finger. But I often only trust what I can see. And often seeing God working around us, well, let's face it, it requires stepping back, taking a look at the big picture. And often, if we're honest, we only understand what God is doing at best after the fact. When we reflect in the heat of the moment, if we're mired in the nitty-gritty, we will often miss the big picture of God moving around us. It might just be that I am missing God in my life while I'm focused on the minutiae of my day. But Jesus, of course, has a trick up his sleeve for us, right? (coughs) In the wilderness, he invites us to recline on the grass. In the bustle of our lives, he invites us to take a break and relax. He asks us to bring what we have to get through the day. It may seem paltry, a few fish and some bread. But he invites us to feast on what is available in our lives already. 
And then he does, you know, his Jesus thing. Somehow what we thought wasn't enough to get by actually fills us and takes care of our basic needs. Somehow, once we're not obsessed with what we are doing and pay a little more attention to what God is doing, somehow we can see that we can have a feast, even a good party, in the midst of our wilderness with whatever is at hand. I often find it interesting how people relate how great their childhood was when their family didn't have much. Are you one of those people? They share stories of how happy they were in simpler times. Is that just romanticizing what were difficult former times? Or maybe something greater is at work. Maybe we can have better times when we quit worrying about getting everything, doing everything, experiencing the greatest thing at every moment. Our culture is so obsessed with getting the most out of every opportunity. So much so, the kids often don't have much play time. And we as adults don't have a chance to be very spontaneous, spontaneous anymore. And our families, our families need to get out calendars just to find time to hang out. Are we missing something? Maybe spending all our time trying to get the most out of everything isn't a good approach. Maybe we should let someone show us what's great right around us in our lives as they are. Maybe we should put down the perfect life guidebooks, ditch the best way to get ahead maps, and quit listening to the 10 best whatever that no one should miss. Maybe our fear of missing out is, well, causing us to miss out. We are lost in details when the world is all around us to enjoy. And maybe Jesus is inviting us to something better. Jesus seems to find pleasant places for relaxing, even in the deserts of our lives. Jesus promises to let us feast on what we already have. And Jesus asks to trust him as a life guide. He says, look up. Take it in. God is here. It's not wrong to plan or have goals or be responsible. It's necessary, we know, to take care of the basics and cover future prospects, but if our planning and anxiety causes us to miss out on the magical moments when God is healing and shining hope around us, then we have lost out and instead gotten buried in life's worries. Then we are just like the disciples, missing out on God's feast because we're worried about just one meal. Who knows? If we look for God working around us this moment, maybe we don't have to worry about finding dinner ourselves. If we spend time with God, maybe that's more important than filling other small needs. And if we bring what we have already to Jesus, maybe God can make things work. Maybe what little we have is already enough. And maybe, just maybe, 